health, specifically around the environmental impacts and, and challenge in terms of climate impacts of our transportation fuel use. Um, I'm not a resource economist, so I'm in no position to debate with you about the resource potentials and uh, the physical aspects of uh, resource, resource supply. But I'll talk more about transportation demand and um, different types of alternative fuels and their environmental challenges. So I will first talk about demand. The first first speaker today talked a little bit about demand. I will focus on the global demand and looking out to 100 years. What would our demand look like in the next 100 years? And uh, also talk about alternative energy. What are the technical and economic promises and their, and their economic challenges, as well as technical challenges of these alternative fuels. I'll be talking about biofuels, hydrogen, electricity, um, all the fuels that we know that are technically possible today, but extremely challenging in terms of their economic viability, as, as well as some of the environmental challenges. Um, then I, I will talk just a little bit about my policies. I've been working in California in the last three, uh, four years, supporting California climate policy formulation. In fact, we have a low carbon fuel standard that essentially set a performance standard on um, transportation fuels. Um, essentially, it's a tax. And I won't be, I, I, I won't be talking about the policy, but I'll be talking very in general about climate policy. What would be the role of climate policy and how would that change the landscape of future transportation fuel supplies and demand? Um, I will be using a lot of jargon, so I'll try to do my best to explain them. And but if they're if you're not clear about those jargons, feel free to ask me um, probably during the clarification question and answer session. So first of all, for I'll focus more on the demand discussion. The um, we've, we've done a lot of simulation modelings. We, we um, in the transportation department, we understand the transportation demands pretty well. Um, we are looking globally over the very long term because it's important. It helps us understand what would what would the long term demand be, where the supplies will come from. We the the general two sentence conclusion based on our research is the transportation demand for travel including passenger travel and freight travel, will increase dramatically over the next century, especially in developing countries, as you heard from the first speaker. The passenger tra travel, and the freight and passenger travel will shift to larger personal cars and lighter trucks and more on-road transportation. As a result, the energy intensity, which is basically the amount of energy we need to move a mile of you know, distance, the, the energy intensity of passenger travel and freight transportation will rise for developing countries dramatically. But, but at the same time, the energy intensity in developed countries will stabilize or even decrease quite a bit because of a, um, a lot of vehicle efficiency standard. In the US, we have the most stringent um, truck standard. In fact, our, our light duty efficiency standards are lagging. Uh, among all the developed countries and even like in, among some of the developing countries. But overall, the energy intensity of developed countries will flatten or decrease, but the energy intensity of, of passenger travel and freight travel in develop, con developing countries will increase. Uh, the t as a result, the total transportation energy demand globally will grow by more than three times in the next century, from about 90 EDA joule, that's 10 to the 18, uh, in 2005 to three, more than 300 either during 2100. And that increase our greenhouse gas emissions from today's level about seven million metric tons to more than 19 million metric tons if we don't have a climate policy. If we have a climate policy in, in this particular case, assuming we have a carbon tax that put, a, put some value on um, producing, I emitting greenhouse gas emissions, that would change the business formula, change the cost of producing energy in a very dramatic way, and I'll show you in the following graph, that can in somehow 
have a lot of impact in, in our society in terms of how, how the supplies, how the demands are met and where the supply come from. And that would have some impact in reducing the overall energy demand through the efficiency improvements, technological change, and the overall greenhouse gas emissions can be reduced to slide, just slightly above today's, emission, it, today's level. And I'll use some of the graphics to show how we come to that conclusion. So I'm basically telling you the conclusion up front. So here's a slide that shows the global transportation service demand. Service demand means that the, dis the amount of travel you need to, that's essentially miles or kilo kilometers. And so on the, pas on the passenger side, you have the personal kilometer travel, and you also have the personal kilometer travel per person globally. This is looking at the global average personal kilometer travel per person will increase and the ter total um, and the population grow will, will grow at a faster rate, therefore the total passenger kilometer travel will increase at a faster rate. And then for the freight sector, you also have the ton miles. That's how we measure how much distance and how much weight uh, our society need in order to meet all our demand, you know, closing, um, basically ship, ship everything we need. And the, the time mile of travel per GDP will e decrease slightly due to technological change, lighter, bigger trucks that can move more things more efficiently, but the, the increased demand uh, as a function of GDP will also grow, therefore the total time mile travel will increase dramatically. So that's the big picture globally over the next 100 years. Here's a breakdown by mode of transportation, passenger transportation specifically. Uh, in general, we expect the passenger travel will shift to faster modes. In fact, we, everybody probably knows, probably half of people come here by airplane. Um, the, if you look at historical evolution, if, when we talk about modes, basically, you have the vehicle travel, you have air travel, public transportation, um, in, across all countries, especially in developed countries, the share of public transportation is decreasing over time. Share of tra vehicle travels increase over time. And most dramatically, what we observe is share of aviation will, tra will increase even at a faster rate. And, um, but that share will actually relatively stable except the share of aviation for um, shale aviation, will, that, that relative share will relate, will stay relative stable for developed countries. For developing countries, the story, we all know the story. Let's see if I have another slide. That's right. For developing countries, especially India and China, will their share for public transportation will significantly shrink compared to today's level. They will increase their increase use for vehicles and aviation will increase dramatically. All those are demand projections that will significantly increase the demand for vehicle technologies, airplane technologies, and fuel use demand. Um, here's a projection about the share, different sizes of car share for uh, personal vehicles. Again, the share for uh, developed countries, Japan, USA, European countries will stay relatively stable. US, uh, I didn't show you pre-2005, most people know our share for light, light trucks increased substantially over the last 50 years. Um, we expect the same thing will happen in India and China. The, right now there's a lot of two-wheelers and three-wheelers that are actually very energy efficient in moving people that use actually relatively little energy, those share will, will dramatically decrease over time. Um, there, there will be significantly increase in larger, bigger cars, maybe a more SUV, but there's some constraint because their cities, t they tend to be um, denser cities um, regardless. Uh, we expect some kind of dramatic increase in bigger cars and more energy intensive cars. Uh, in the next 50, 100 years in those developing countries. So as a result, here's a graph for energy intensity of passenger travel. So it's megajoule per passenger travel miles will rise for developing countries. So you can see uh, as a result of increasing stringent efficiency standard in developed countries, the energy intensity of moving people will decrease for developed countries. But 
as a, um, due to technological progress, and also we expect some kind of penetration of battery electric vehicles, BEV, and fuel cell electric vehicles over the next century. Those two kind of shift will decrease our energy intensity. But at the same time, you have the pressure of lower share of public transportation, bigger cars, more private vehicle travel from developing countries. As a result, the global average energy intensity in develop, uh, overall was relatively stable over time. And you t if you multiply with the population growth, that gives you a sense about the total energy demand uh, globally over the next 100 years. Same story for the freight transportation. Uh, freight transportation, we expect the share of growth will increase uh, compared to rail and shipping. Same story, that we, have, we will have significant technological progress that will reduce the energy intensity on one hand, but demand growth will grow much faster than technological progress. Therefore, the energy intensity and total energy demand from freight transport also will increase quite dramatically. The, as a result, this is kind of a summary graph that shows that for both passenger travel and for energy travel, the total energy use are projected to increase very dramatically by more than three times in the next century. Most of the fuel demand will come from liquid fuel. Uh, we actually don't use the term oil. We use liquids, and you will see in the next following slides that liquids can come from many different sources. And so it, in, this is a scenario where there's no serious climate policy that you will see liquid fuel will still dominate almost, uh, most of the energy, primary energy supply. With, uh, we, we might see, we will, I think we will see some penetration of electricity in the hydrogen because there is some kind of commitment from uh, European countries and developed countries to push for lighter cars, more efficient cars, and more environmental friendly cars. So the, the share of electricity, car, electric cars is already increasing in developed countries. So we expect that trend to co continue out by very, very slowly over time. Um, so the, the, this is the slide of summary statistics. Um, so today, uh, just to recap, transportation sector is almost entirely based on crude oil today. Total greenhouse gas emissions, like I said, about 7 million metric tons of CO2. Uh, the next term is a little bit tricky. It's a life cycle, wheel to wheel energy efficiency is only about 14%. That means that of one gigajoule or one petajoule uh, of energy that we put into, we extract from the ground, only 0.4 actually being used to power our vehicles, to move people, move goods, and movement. Our overall transportation sector is the lowest energy, it has the lowest energy efficiency compared to all the other sectors like buildings and industrial sector. Um, I calculate carbon intensity, that's gran 478 gram of CO2 per petajoule of useful energy, that's a very tricky technical term, that basically measure the amount of carbon intensity for every unit of energy we use in our society for the transportation sector. Um, this is for 205, I'll show you the future picture that will look very, very different from this picture with and without climate change. Um, without policy, like I said, the share of carbon, in well, without policy, we expect that share of carbon intensive liquid fuels will increase. Uh, this is a graph from Adam Rand and I, Stanford, that shows that, um, you know, globally, oil and gas industry actually is trem spent tremendous capital to extract new, to extract and explore new resources, and that's about one trillion dollars per year. A spending every year. We project that the, if, um, the pre based on my previous projection slides that I show the projection, the total projected cumulative transportation <coughs> fuel use uh, between 2005 and 2100 is on the order of about 5,000 etajoule. And if you believe this graph that shows that oil can come from many different sources, starting from convention. So the top graph shows the cost of production from lower costs uh, from conventional to enhanced oil recovery, tar sand from Canada, um, gas to liquid, coal to liquid, and all the way to oil shale. 
Um, this is the this is a picture for for uh, cost of production, and the bottom shows the total greenhouse gas emissions. And I would say that actually, right now as of today, we are using almost all of the resources. So it. Uh, it's not true that we would always start from the lowest cost. It depends on a lot of constraints, geological constraints and business models. So in fact, we are already using conventional oil, enhanced oil recovery, especially in California, oil sands from Canada. Oil companies are investing a lot of money in gas to liquid today. The only, um, we are, the latest EIA projection, uh, IEA projection project that with the development of shell gas, we'll see more shell oil. Um, so we might see more of these. So I, I think the cost will come down dramatically. The only, diff the only thing that we haven't explored quite in a very big scale is coal to liquid. It's not, we don't know how to do it. It's not, it's still, it's more expensive but it's mostly environmental constraint. Coal to liquid uses a lot of water. Water constraint is a big issue for coal to liquid. Otherwise, it's actually economically possible to use coal to liquid if needed. So if you believe this graph, on the y-axis, it's, it's actually about 18,000 uh, 18, gigabillion barrel is about 110,000 etajoules. So you can compare that our projected total demand is this number. And this graph shows that we still have this much that can be extracted. Again, I'm not a resource economist. This is from a graph from the colleagues. I'm just trying to point out um, what we think the potential source can come from with different cost levels. So why do we talk about alternative energy? Um, um, you know, there are a couple reasons. Energy security is a big issue, especially oil imports from um, politically unstable countries. Uh, there's a lot of wealth transfer from US and other countries to Middle Eastern countries. That's a big economic issue. When we talk about energy security, we tend to think about it's a big e economic issue uh, because of the wealth trans transfer and the shock to the economy. Um, and then there's also the issue of climate change, which I've talked about, that it's a serious concern, especially in California, we passed a law that we're going to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by 2050. So most of our energy policy in California really center around how do we deal with this challenge of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Transportation sector contribute to more than 40% of our state's greenhouse gas emissions. So California is a state that, that's really treating greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector very seriously. There's also a lot of environmental impacts of associated with oil use that I will actually show you quite a few slides. Um, air quality, <coughs> land use, I'll focus on land use in my slides because we do, we do a lot of research on the land use impacts and greenhouse gas emissions associated with land use impacts. There's also issue with water quality and that, that's just a few environmental impacts. I'm sure the audience are very well versed in the wide range of environmental impacts associated with oil use. So we've done quite a lot of study looking at the oil impact, the land use impacts of alternative fuels, including fossil fuels and other alternative fuel resources. Most people, uh, most of the news stories dominate in the news media in the late last two, three years is about land use impacts of biofuels. And um, I won't talk too much about it, but the issue with land use impacts is bio of biofuel is biofuel is very, it's not energy dense compared to oil, so you need a lot of land to grow, a lot of feedstock to generate uh, moderate amount of energy. As a result, you have, you can grow lots of lots of bio, you need probably, there's a, both the direct impact and indirect impact. The direct impact, you need to go convert a lot of lands or use a lot of existing land um, to grow biofuels and that would have significant environmental and greenhouse gas impacts. The indirect impact is you, if you grow biofuel in crop, existing cropland, you're going to push the crop production into other places, maybe, maybe in Brazil, in Indonesia, in other places. 
uh, where they would chop down the forest and produce um, produce those those crops that are di displaced by biofuel production. The most obvious evidence is the soybean production in Brazil that's just boomed significantly in the last couple of years due to the U.S. climate the, due to the U.S. Bio biofuel policy that increased the eth corn ethanol production. Traditionally, our corn production is corn, soy, corn, soy rotation. Now it's corn, 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 corn. So the, a lot, very large portion of soybean goes to Brazil. It's produced in Brazil. The, at the same time, there's also land use impact associated with oil and gas production. Uh, they're non-trivial. There's uh, environmental impacts associated with habitat loss, fragmentation, ecological and environmental impact. We focus more on the greenhouse gas emissions because we're really f uh, doing a lot of greenhouse gas policy. Here are two graphs of um, oil wells, aerial shots that we analyze. On the left, your left hand side is the oil wells look like in California. They're very dense. And um, the, the other graph shows the oil wells look like, conventional oil well look like in Alberta. Next two graphs shows the oil, land use of oil sands production. The, on the left hand side is surface mining. The other one is uh, in situ production. There are two ways to produce oil sands. Surface mining, you basically take out the whole land, wash the, extract the sand, wash them, extract the bitumen and put the sands back. The other is, is in situ production. The land use impact of in situ production is significantly smaller than the land use impact of uh, surface mining. Most two thirds of the oil sands resource in Canada are actually in situ mining. So you will, I, I, you can expect this, the land use impacts from surface mining will cap to some extent, but it's still significant today and next couple, uh, next couple of decades. Uh, one of the significant greenhouse gas emission source, of, uh, it's actually a methane source of oil sand surface mining is actually a tailings pond. Um, environmentalists like to call it toxic pond because um, while whenever wild birds, you probably read the story of wild bird resting on those ponds and they die because they're so toxic. They happen also to remit a lot of methane emissions which are 20 times more toxic environmentally speaking uh, in terms of its greenhouse gas potentials. So we did a lot of research measuring the greenhouse gas, the methane emissions from Tailings Pond. They are actually almost like, look like soda pop, bubble pumps because they're, they emit so much methane gas that they, um, they, they just produce bubbles. And um, so another issue of oil science extraction that we did research on is the peatlands. Peatlands actually, uh, people, uh, one thing about Bio, biofuel, uh, especially palm oil, is the, the destruction of peatlands in Indonesia and Malaysia. Peatlands are important because they store a huge amount of carbon over hundreds and thousands, millions of years. And once you extract them, they're not coming back. You cannot reclaim them, you cannot restore them. So peatland is a very, very important carbon resource, uh, storage resource, and as well as environmentally speaking, that they regulate, they have a lot of functions in terms of protecting the environment. Um, most people, uh, studies focus on peatlands in Indonesia and Malaysia, but boreal peatlands actually store 85% of total global peat. So boreal peatlands actually, uh, carbon speaking, uh, has a lot more carbon than peatlands in Malaysia and Indonesia. Nobody actually have looked at the, peat, the destruction of peatlands in, as a result of oil science extraction. And so if you look at these two graphs that on the left basic show the oil sands resource in Alberta, and the right, land, right hand side of the graph shows the peatlands overlay. So you can see that the, they basically, there's a very important overlap be, between the peatland, uh, boreal peatlands, and the oil sands resources. So uh, they're mostly, it, once this area is explored, the peatlands will be gone. The peel, uh, this is just a photograph of peatland drain, uh, peel, the kind of picture of peatlands and how once peatland is, ex is destroyed, how carbon will be emitted and the peat, basically the whole peatlands will, will die. So more about, I'll show, um, that, that's kind of the picture, the discussion about environmental impact. I'll talk more about alternative energies. 
uh, in the next couple slides. And um, this is the, what we call reference energy system. Basically, this is a picture of energy system today. We have from the primary energy source, we have basically oil resources from different sources, like I said, conventional and unconventional, oil sands. And we also have a little bit of biofuel, so corn, soybean, <coughs> maize oil, palm, palm oil. They go into conversion technologies, refineries that can refine oils or biofuels and the transportation sector is very, very much, very much homogeneously liquid oil um, that power all modes of transportation from personal travel to vehicles to, to trucks and to, to, our, to airplanes. In the future, the transportation sector can could look very different as they can not well because there are, uh, there, uh, the, most of the alternative resources are much more expensive. So from primary energy perspective, we can produce energy from almost all kind of resources that you can think of. Um, you know, bio, more biofuels, shale gas, shale oil, gas, nuclear, um, solar, geothermal, any kind of primary resource can be used, can be converted one way or the other to basically three different types of what we call the secondary or final energy, gasoline, diesel, <coughs> Um, biofuels, electricity, and hydrogen, and then you need the you need the comparable vehicle technology, transportation technologies to go with these different fuels. So fuels and technologies are they go together, and that's what typically people talk about the chicken and egg problem that you need to have both at the same time, and that's the significant that's a major challenge for all these alternative fuels. Um, we did have a lot of alternative fuel policies in the US in the last 30 years. For those of you who remember, we, uh, we like to call it called fuel digital ph phenomenon. 30 years ago, it was steam fuel. We thought the Department of Energy wanted us to believe that in 30 years, the, the world will run on coal to liquid steam fuel. Then it was methanol, electricity, tw 20 years ago, tw 1980s, lots of little cute electric cars, they died. Uh, this famous story who killed the electric car. But anyway, then hydrogen, corn ethanol, and then today's electricity. So if we don't have a durable policy, we're just likely to recycle them all over again. So um, we are working really hard on policy solutions on how do we provide a more sustainable environment to make those uh, alternative fuels viable. I won't talk about those policy today. Um, I'll just go over a few pictures of alternative fuels and, and point out some of their challenges. Biofuels can derive from a lot of different resources, either existing food-based food -based feedstock, corn, corn, soybean, sorghum, sorghum or, um, or sugar beets, or from agricultural waste, agricultural residues, forest residues, uh, or dictated energy crops which, uh, like switchgrass and miscanthus. Uh, Department of Energy spend a lot of resources looking at those potential resources, and they tend to be geographically located in different locations. So these maps basically show the our estimate of resource potentials from these different resource these different biofuel feedstock resources. Um, we est uh, we estimate this this is kind of our resource potential estimate. I'll skip for the interest of time. I'll skip that. There are a lot of concerns for biofuels, mostly it's the food and fuel price, food and fuel debate, and land use issue. I talked a little bit about land use issue, uh, bio uh, including uh, biodiversity loss, and water issue is, is another huge issue for producing biofuels. Um, as, a, um, as a result of the land use issue, actually scientists do not agree with the biofuel actually contribute or help to mitigate climate emissions or actually worsen climate, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions. So there's a huge debate about biofuels if climate benefits, and the jury is still out there. There are actually a couple of lawsuits associated with whether biofuels is, is actually improved climate or not. Um, so moving on to electricity, we spend a lot of, in our department, we spend a lot of resources studying the electric cars, how people use them, uh, when people charge them, so it's a very, very fun topic. It's key primary challenge, challenge is battery, battery cost, battery range, 
Uh, otherwise, uh, it, it has a lot of potential in terms of the convenience, in terms of um, environmental, its environmental uh, performance, so on and so forth, but they're just expensive. So the, the challenge for electric cars is on the consumer side. They're too expensive for consumers to buy them fast enough at large scale. In terms of resource, it's a, it's a very easy resource for, for large scale of adoption of uh, electric cars. Um, so here's some cost, some numbers, some people like numbers. So at $3, it, it, electricity is a low, low cost, low carbon fuel. Um, if you do calculation, three dollars a gallon of um, gasoline uh, used rate average efficiency. It's about you spend about twelve cents per gal per mile. For electric cars, with the average pricing in California, which is actually more expensive than most of the states, it's about a quarter of that. So about three cents per mile driving on an electric mile versus gasoline mile. Carbon intensity again. California actually has very low carbon, uh, low carbon electricity because we have higher share of renewables. Um, so uh, carbon intensity about a third of uh, gasoline driving a gasoline vehicles. Um, I won't talk about hydrogen. Hydrogen. The challenge of hydrogen. DOE is investing a lot of money in improving the performance of hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Um, they think the range issue can be, can be dealt with. The range issue, hydrogen vehicles, is actually better than electric vehicles. Again, the challenge is on the hydrogen storage and the cost of hydrogen vehicles and the infrastructure. So um, I kind of, this is a table I won't go through, basically looking at different fuel types, biofuel, electricity, and hydrogen. And there are different challenges. Um, the, green the green text basically show that they have smaller challenges. Uh, red check box basically say that they have bigger challenges associated with different issues like, such as resource collection and extraction, transport or resource conversion, transport and refueling. So you can see that for electric cars, they actually have less challenges in terms of across this fuel supply infrastructure spectrum. Biofuel has quite a few, so is hydrogen. Um, so this is a sim similar table that talk that look at from resource perspective, technology challenges, economics, and what would be the transition challenge. So um, let me see. Here's a summary slide. Sustainability. We are actually spending a lot of effort trying to understand what are what can we do to improve the sustainability performance of these alternative fuels given that there are quite a different challenges that I point, uh, briefly point out. So we are developing some sustainability standards um, in California, and especially and in European countries that are also trying to adopt a, a lot of biofuels. So it's another fuel of research we're working on. Um, so a few modeling results, looking up to 2050 and 2000, these are the simulation results that we look at, looking at what would be the impact of climate policy on transportation demand and fuel supply. This graph shows the, cal shows the picture for California. I don't have the business as usual projection, but this slide basically shows that with climate policy in 2050, with, this is a very aggressive climate policy, 80% reduction by 20, uh, from the 1990 level by 2050. We still expect, expect some kind of liquid fuel, gasoline, diesel, in the transportation mix, fuel mix, and this is across all modes. Uh, we expect more bio-based fuels, uh, even including bio-CCS, you burn biomass and you use carbon capture and sequestration to sequester carbon. And those fuels were likely used in other modes of transportation, especially aviation and shipping, that basically still need to rely on liquid fuels. The, in the light duty sector, in order to meet this stringent climate target goal, almost entirely uh, light duty sector will have to rely on electricity and hydrogen. Uh, globally, this is the global picture would look like in 2100 uh, based on our model projections. Like I said, the demand, and this graph shows the demand is about less than 100 today, will increase by more than three thirds to about 350, 380 eta joules by 2100. <coughs> Uh, globally as a total, we st the crude oil production or needed to meet that demand will about double 
and we uh, use a different shade, you probably can see the crude will come from increasingly heavier sources, oil sands, unconventional crude oil. But that's still not enough, and this is probably the issue of peak oil. With, even if you double the crude oil demand today, you still not, it's not going to be enough to meet the future demands. So the other half will come from the other sources, coal to liquids, bioliquids, uh, coal to electricity, gas, gas to electricity, gas to liquids. So essentially in 2100 without climate policy, we will need a lot, we will need a lot of alternative sources uh, from fossil energy bases because they're cheap and they are easy to make. Industry know how to make them at very large scale cheaply compared to alternatives like uh, renewables and biofuels. So lots of coal to liquid, biofuel to liquid, gas to liquid, and electricity and hydrogen will mostly come from fossil energy resources like coal and gas. With climate policy, and this is a very stringent climate policy that would amount to almost $1,000 a ton by 2100, we will actually see similar level of demand, similar level of transportation system infrastructure, but the primary energy supply will need to come from very low carbon sources, um, such as nuclear and renewable, biofuels and gas, and so we're still going to use a lot of electricity and hydrogen, except they need to produce from renewable sources. So that's kind of a take home message from our model simulations. And actually, I don't have a conclusion slide. I think I'm going to end here and look forward to lots and lots of challenges and discussions. Thank you very much, uh, Sonia. We are just going to have, uh, we have about a half an hour or more of, of questions, and I know there's gonna be a, a lot in, from the audience, but uh, I am actually gonna moderate this. I get to do the, uh, the armchair thing. Um, so I, I first of all, I just wanna say I don't think I think you've answered a lot of burning questions for myself and, and this audience, and I think uh, it, it becomes very clear. We've got increasing carbon intensity of fuels, growing population, and we've got a transportation sector that is pretty darn inefficient. So we either have two choices, uh, or both, decrease the carbon intensity or radically increase the efficiency. Um, how would you, I mean, the low carbon fuel standard is about one, um, from the ITS standpoint, you know, at UC Davis, you know, are you, you're working on both, but where do you think the, where's the biggest bang for the buck, or where's the biggest potential? And, uh, you know, what, sh what should maybe we be thinking about more of, and not sort of focus on how much carbon we can squeeze out of a gallon of liquid fuel? Um, that's a very tough question because it may take a really long time to answer. Let me think about a good way to answer that very shortly. Um, you know, we think there's demands, and demand, most people know that they're pretty inelastic to prices. So demand will continue to grow. So the challenge is really for industry to figure out uh, how to supply that demand from um, Econom uh, economically and cost effectively. And for us, it's in, in an environmental sensitive way. And so we talk about environmental standards, sustainability standards, and greenhouse gas emission policy in California, uh, in the US. And there are also a lot of discussion about greenhouse gas emission <coughs> uh, climate policy in European countries. Um, the kind of the fundamental uh, belief or principle of us working on low carbon fuel standard, and I, I should probably explain that a little bit, is basically what, um, we set the carbon in intensity standard and require the fuel providers and importers who provide fuels or import fuel to California to reduce their carbon intensity of the fuel supply over time. So industry basically, we basically set the standard. So you can think about it almost like a vehicle efficiency standard. You said it applies to fuels. And uh, it's up to the industry to decide how they're going to meet it in the most business sensible way, economically sensible way, while meeting the environmental target that we set, set um, 
that we require them to do. And over the long term, I think the answer are probably very um, straightforward, as far as I can tell, that over the long term, the light duty vehicles, if we want to really significantly reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, we really have to rely on electric vehicles and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles that come from renewable sources over the long term. They're very expensive to do. We need a lot of political power to lead us down to that route. Okay, so just a quick follow-up. Uh, electric motors versus internal combustion engines, big jump in efficiency, but then you versus transportation systems, uh, mass transit, et cetera. So are, basically, are you guys electric vehicle folks? And if we poured all the resources in there, would we, uh, you know, or, or is there sort of a limit if you have 200 million cars in the United States, and I don't know how many billion, I guess we're heading for two billion cars uh, in the foreseeable future. Um, you know, is that, if we were all driving electric cars, how would the climate problem look? Let alone whether or not we could, you know, capital and materials, et cetera, accomplish it. But if we were all driving electric cars, I guess it's a math question, how would, how would we be looking? Um, I, I should probably clarify that we're not a big EV person. Okay, <laughs> we, we do a lot of research. You can give the, the, the take-home point on that. There's a lot of detail behind that, but but it's good to start with the, like you said, with the with the. Sure. I, I I think consumers get to make that choice what kind of vehicle they want to drive, uh, as long as they want to pay the environmental costs that you know we impose. Uh, because the reason I say that is there are range issues associated with EV. And there, uh, some families might find other, you know, mix of vehicle technologies like fuel cell meet their need better. So it's up to the consumers to decide. Um, and I would also say that not all the electric vehicles are environmental friendly because it's a whole energy system, like you point out. It depends on where does the electricity come from. And there are many dirty ways to generate electricity. When I say dirty, excuse me for the word, be that just mean high, high carbon intensity. So electricity can come from coal and natural gas that are more car carbon intensive. So it, you need to work on the system. You need to have a comprehensive climate policy, if that's the angle, um, so you don't squeeze the problem from one sector to the other. Okay. So I have only one question reserved, but I'm not only in the case the mic doesn't work. So <laughs> uh, please, let's go to the audience. And let's get some diversity in our, in our questioners. Yeah, uh, I must say that I'm glad that you said it was a scenario, because I learned that scenario, uh, you can have scenarios that never can happen. I mean, it's, 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 and uh, the thing that you were presenting, you know, I'm saying, I'm, I've never seen such garbage before. Uh, and then, I mean, the, the kind of numbers you're presenting for 2,100 in business as usual, but I mean, it's absolutely not possible to reach. I mean, take for instance, if you shall go into making 4 million barrels of oil per day from coal to coal to liquids, you know, you take 60% more coal than the United States is using today for just that small fraction. Or 60% of all the coal that China is using, we are doing these 4 million barrels. So, I mean, what you had that, okay, you can play with the computer, but that's not Thank right. you, Shell. Thank you, Shell. Um, over here, please. Go ahead and stand up. Yeah, there was a recent McKinsey study about battery prices coming down a little bit further. Do you agree with that? And do you agree with maybe 5 to 8% compound decline rate? Is that your estimate? Also, do you have any rule of thumb as far as the precious metal use in hydrogen fuel cell stacks? which are one of the most important factors in getting fuel cell vehicles price competitive. Right, so your first question you referred to McKinsey study that look at the cost of electric vehicles or electric batteries. Batteries. Okay. So um, the, there are lots of numbers out there and there's, there's one of them that's possible and we think they are reasonable but it's hard to predict. So our estimate, we take into account all ranges of possibilities, and um, nobody really knows. But we, th we think their numbers are reasonable. Um, the second question about precious metal, we look at the issue. Uh, we, have, we think we have a good handle on uh, what kind of metals that, that uh, how much we'll, we'll need to, if the entire fleet is converted to fuel cell vehicles by a certain period of time and the recy possible recycling rate. That's, and we, we don't think that's a problem. That's one angle of looking at it. The other thing is you got um, 
I'm, I'm actually prior, I'm actually also a technology historian, so I look at a lot of cases, case studies of technological change, history of technological, technological change. So I'm a big believer of you know, technological change, and I, 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 I'm not so certain that by 2050 or you know, in many years, we, we will still rely on that you know, precious metal. So I think there's a possibility of diversifying to different options. Um, okay, um, um, I, so first of all, this symbol EJ is exadu. Um, you know, that's the correct pronunciation. Um, second of all, the world right now produces 162 exadules in crude oil and uh, lease condensate, and about 180 odd exadules when you add natural gas plant liquids and everything else, including biofuels and whatever fisher traps you have. And this means, for one thing, that the world will never produce the 300 exajoules that you are predicting in the future. So that's uh, just, I will refer to my distinguished colleague uh, to the description of that study. Uh, <laughs> now, if you mean that we can use biomass and uh, then you quoting uh, using about 50 exajoules in biomass. Uh, you need to understand that the entire world agriculture probably, and I have the numbers, uh, I just don't have my computer with me, but if you add the, all the crops on this planet plus the roots and the stems, it will be about 60 exajoules. Okay. So you are proposing to burn everything that we have uh, as fuels. Of course, that perhaps will not happen. Um, now, when it comes to hydrogen and uh, fuel cells vehicles, uh, I have a friend in, in Munich uh, who drives a, a hybrid BMW. The cost of that car is 1 million euros. And that perhaps is not a viable uh, solution for India. Um, so, you know, so, so, I guess, you know, I'm trying to be positive here. What I see is a tremendous disconnect between reality and such studies. And you're not the only one. That's not the only one. Yes? Let me just try and bridge. Well, yeah. I think what's important here, we, we understand, I mean, you, let's, just, let's just deal with this. Yes. Okay? There's, if there's, uh, if the energy, total energy consumption within the transportation sector or the economy overall is something different, we can talk about that. I mean, that's what, well, that's what the people out here can bring to the conversation, is the limit on the energy. I think what's very important, though, to the conversation between our respective communities yes. is understanding the relative mix. I think your work on, and we should, we should either learn from the models and find out what the assumptions and inputs are, et cetera, but the relative energy intensity of the energy mix is really what we were trying to get at today. It's not just the absolute energy consumption, but this shift in carbon intensity this inefficiency in the transportation sector. I think we can all agree on that. So let's let's focus okay. on that. And that's what we're trying to do. Right. So go ahead, Sonia. Yes. Uh, yes. Please reply. So um, I definitely take the criticism, and uh, we can discuss assumptions of what we assume about resource availability. So I'll be more, more than happy to talk to you afterwards. Um, I spend a lot of time studying biofuels and. Um, you know, the latest IPCC report that's going to come out in 2012 actually estimate the potential biomass, bio, biomass and bioenergy resource can add up to about 50, uh, anywhere from 50 etajoules to 300 etajoules. And exajoules. Exajoules. And um, the, the lower range is if you apply a lot of sustainability criteria that limit where they can be grown and how they can be grown. So there's lots of different numbers out there. I respect your numbers and, and views, and we can definitely talk about those assumptions. But I, you know, I also agree with you that the, the issue that we want to talk about is this urgency in increasing demand and urgency of we're shifting to higher carbon resources because they're cheap and they're easy to do at a large scale, and the decreasing Another thing is the decreasing energy efficiency of utilizing those higher carbon resources. Okay, I'd like to, could we get a microphone to Professor Zigarides, um, who's, who's gonna have something very 
useful to say about this. Uh, uh, Kyriakos, I am going to go to one question while we're, while, while we're ready. Kyriakos, we'll wait for one question and come back to you, okay? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, first, first thanks for, for the modeling on the impact of policy. I think that was very important and, and I'd like to see more, of, uh, hopefully we'll see more of that. Uh, I guess my question is, uh, how do we really know or are we really confident that uh, the response of, uh, that we have an inelastic response to, to price? Yeah. Because I think there's some evidence that, for instance, in Cascadia, that, we're seeing, that we've seen uh, some reduction of vehicle miles traveled and, and gas consumption uh, as a result of high oil price even before the recession. Uh, and also, I think uh, even Mr. Rapier's um, presentation this morning showed quite a change in the slope of uh, consumption uh, with high oil price even in the developing world. So is that really a good assumption? Um, yeah, it's a little bit complicated. You're right that um, we are response, we are, our elasticity to oil price change is not zero. We know that looking at the study, 19, compared to the study that looking at the elasticity, basically change of demand uh, uh, in response to change in prices actually decreased by about 10 times compared to 30 years ago. And so um, the 30 years ago, about, it's about, it was about 0.1, now it's actually about 0.01. And that, that there's a lot of reason to explain that change is because of the, you know, our built environment change, our D GDP grow, actually grow. So the, the cost of driving per mile of travel actually decrease. And so there are many reasons that explain that shift. And in the future, there's also possibility of when, um, you know, if our built environment change, if we have built out more public transportation infrastructure, uh, people are more educated, more willing, new gener newer generation are more willing to experiment different lifestyle. All those will change, and that's a very positive thing. And we're modeling business as usual. That doesn't mean that that will happen. It's kind of a scenario that if we don't make significant changes, we think that that would be the trend that we, we expect that to happen. But a lot of people are working on land use, land use change, and. Land use we actually mean urban environment land use, and so I think those kind of research need to continue to for us to spend a lot of effort on that. Professor Kiri, uh, Zigarini. Uh, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that we absolutely need to do something about our, our carbon footprint. On the other hand, uh, I can give a lot of example of examples of. Uh, good intentions that led to very bad consequences. And, you know, let me stick to a couple of uh, things here. We're talking about hydrogen. Where is the hydrogen going to come from? If we take hydrogen from a hydrocarbon, then immediately any argument about the feasibility of a fuel cell car falls flat on its feet on simple thermodynamics arguments. Right now, if you accept the fact that hydrogen is going to come from a hydrocarbon, you pick your hydrocarbon, you are going to have a reforming step. Once you put the efficiency of the reforming step, basically the fuel cell car has exactly the same effic efficiency as a hybrid car that you can go out and buy right now for $30,000. I, I don't think that if you, there, there may be a few people who can you know, spend a million euros, and you can say, well, yes, it's going to become cheaper, but simple thermodynamics basically tell us that we cannot do that. So if you want to include hydrogen in the future mix, you have to tell us where it's going to come from, uh, what we're, we're going to use when you say we're going to convert coal to liquids. Well, you have to add a lot of hydrogen there, which means that a lot of the natural gas that's the most efficient way. That's the, well, water, you need electroly electrolysis, right? Uh, so, well, I, uh, we can talk about it. Well, okay, why don't you go ahead, ahead. Go ahead and respond. But there, there are lots of fundamental arguments that actually, yeah, uh, you know, speak against and require us to be much more cautious about making this go One last thing. You made the, compar the uh, comparison how 
uh, what's the uh, carbon emis emissions per mile for California. If you do it for, tex for Texas, Prius actually is a, it's a part right now with the leaf. And if you do it for Kentucky, or most of the you know, eastern US, and US, where they use more carbon, more, more coal, we use significantly uh, you know, a, a large amount of natural, natural gas here, and it's worse. So we have to be careful. Okay. I, can I just quickly? Please. Please. I absolutely agree everything you say. And I think that's a take home message that we really need to care for. We cannot push for one solution. We need to look at the system. And so technology is not a solution. You, the, you need to work on a system solution. Like, uh, like the slides I showed that um, the, the, the more you rely on more energy conversions, electricity, electric cars, fuel cell vehicles, you are doing more energy conversion, you're wasting more energy. And I, you know, I, I just agree with you that you need to be careful and you need to look at a system perspective and pay attention where primary energy resources come from. So here's what, what's so incredible about what I think the work that, you're, that UC Davis does is, I mean, they've taken on the, the, uh, the leading role in trying to wrestle with this whole life cycle analysis, okay? Theoretically, it's very simple. We're gonna consider everything and we'll weigh it and we'll give it a number. But so theoretically, it's simple and straightforward and very defensible. In practice, it's very difficult. So the California went through a low carbon fuel standard and then they have to set values for different fuels. And you get you know, corn from the Midwest versus corn from California. There is politics involved. Um, and sometimes you choose values that you aren't necessarily, the science isn't necessarily there yet. So would you comment on the, the implementation of what is really what we need to, we do want to reduce the carbon intensity. Um, we do want to increase the energy efficiency. No one in this room should be arguing with that. Um, but it's hard. So just comment on that if you would, that what California is trying to actually push it forward. They do have numbers that have been scientifically established and then politically approved, basically. Right. Um, so I think uh, my talk focused most on physics and technical, technical aspects of this very big challenge. And, um, I, I, I think policy is actually a much bigger challenge because uh, we actually know the technology a little pretty well. We, we know how to calculate them. Um, but the actual policy implementation require making a lot of decisions and sometimes subjective decisions about how do you draw the system boundary, how do you calculate certain numbers and make everybody agree on, everybody want a lower number for them. That's one aspect. The other aspect is the policy, people always say policy go in front of science. And that's exactly how it happens in the real world. Because we know a little bit, we think we're at a point that we want to do something. And when you have a policy in place, you figure, you find out you don't know a lot of things. And so you have this policy push science forward, science push policy forward. It's an iterative and dynamic process. And we're at that stage that we have some numbers for corn ethanol. Then studies come out and say there's this indirect effect, the corn ethanol or some biofuels would actually increase greenhouse gas emissions. So we are in this process of have a policy, finding out more. And the same thing I would say is about sustainability performance of many fuels, that we find out the but environmental groups say the sum of sustainability performance of some biofuels are not acceptable. So we need to do more policy to set a standard. So um, I pretty much think this is a challenge of doing this science policy, science policy iteration, but that's also a very positive thing, I think, to move our society forward. Me, me. over here, uh, Kevin? Um, just wanted to understand your your assumptions on the forecast for freight, mm -hmm. um, where that seems to be very dependent on certain details of global trade. Uh, so in the last 20 years or so, we've integrated China into the global uh, uh, supply chains that, that certainly wasn't there before. And so I want to know, you're, you're obviously extrapolating some kind of a trend. How far back do you go in, in in inferring a, a, a trend line, right. uh, and what are the assumptions there? And then the related question is, on the freight um, numbers, what is the approximate breakdown between 
say, air freight versus shipping versus rail versus trucks. So if it's mostly trucks, then it's not very dependent on global uh, trade patterns. If, on the other hand, it's mostly shipping, then it would be. Right, right. Um, you're probably a PhD student. <laughs> um, joking, because it's, modeling is extremely hard to do. They're uh, on the data issue. So I, it, it, first of all, the, the challenges in making assumptions, like you said, which I'll answer a little bit. And maybe a more fundamental challenge that people are not aware is calibration. In fact, there are so many numbers and models and projections out there, we actually don't know very well about what the energy used today, actually, especially from developing countries. So when we made those projections, we, we collected a lot of data, IEA data, and we find a lot of inconsistency in terms of how countries report, how much they use, and, uh, and, and what they actually use. So we spend a lot of time just to calibrate, to better understand how much was actually the actual ton miles, how much was actually, you know, how many ton miles or personal miles across different modes. So it was already a huge undertaking just to better understand, especially for developing world, world uh, about the energy use patterns and demands today. And, and the, another challenge is making projections, especially for this emerging market, emerging countries where there's quite a, quite a lot of structural change. But you're, you're right on the same, that we sort of take historical patterns and population growth and GDP projections to make those freight assumptions. So, you know, we, can, we, we, we need to do a lot of scenarios just to make diff present different views of possible potential growth in so, those the emerging countries. So I would just like to say I'd love to get some questions from folks who haven't answered, uh, asked a question yet this weekend. Um, Alan, though, how it, so let's make that after. So Alan, however, is our transportation uh, person, so why don't you go ahead? There are two trends that you project that I think I see facts on the ground that contradict the trends. One is that uh, trucks are going to take an increasing share of the developing world's uh, freight. And I'll point out that China is building 20,000 kilometers of new rail tracks this decade. Brazil is building 10,000 kilometers. India is putting in 2,700 kilometers of an all new, their first all freight line. All the other rail lines in India are, are passenger and freight. This will be freight only. And on the declining share of mass transit, China is putting in metros, that is subways, in 44 different cities around China. And Shanghai will be by far the world's largest uh, subway system. And Beijing will be competitive for number two in the world. And with this massive building, China is not the entire developing world, but it's certainly a large chunk of it. And there are other developing nations that are making additional investments in mass transit, although none come close to China. So I see facts on the ground that appear to contradict the trends that you see. Well, let's, let's hope that those trends continue. I mean, I think that's all, all the positive. We'd like to be wrong in that direction. We're worried about being wrong in the other direction. So, um, you know, we're, we look at the numbers and we're aware of some of the facts that you mentioned. Um, and the question is, we, there's, so, when, we, when I talk about shares, there are two things. One is the relative, the gro real, absolute growth and relative growth. So yes, absolute, the real, the real rail for freight transport is growing, but the car and trucks are probably growing at a faster rate. But at the same time, I would admit that there are lots of lots of rooms for improvement for our projections. So we like to collect more data, understand data more, and that would help us to make our, improve our future projections. Absolutely. So we have time for a couple more questions. We have one over here and then the gentleman in the, in the front. Um, even under your very best scenario, even if it all came to pass, the amount of carbon being released into the atmosphere almost triples, or at least doubled. Um, what effect have you figured out for climate change and stuff with that kind of rosy scenario? Um, actually, we were criticized that what we call aggressive policy scenario is not aggressive enough. 
Um, so the scenario I show is actually uh, um, what we call about 5.30 ppm scenario. And as you know, IPCC continue, I probably don't need to explain IPCC, continue to analyze two degree scenario. Uh, that's 450 ppm scenario. So our 530 is about 3.3 .3 degree scenario. So uh, it's debatable whether that's a rosy scenario. We certainly think that's most reasonable people already gave up talking about two degree scenario. I, in my view, but IPCC, the, the newest IPCC will still release a lot of scenario looking at tip two degree. Ours is about 3.3 .3 degrees. Um, first of all, I'm in awe at the amount of homework you've done for this presentation. <laughs> Personally, I'm fairly comfortable with numbers and math, but I find in conversation with friends and relatives that most people aren't. And uh, so it, part of my, my reaction to what I'm hearing all weekend, and especially in this uh, interaction, is that there seems to be a tendency to study things that we can measure and express in numbers. And I kind of wonder about the wisdom of that because ultimately what we're trying to do is get along and be happy. And I'm not sure, uh, my overall impression of, of what I'm hearing at this meeting is that at some level we all agree with Rex Tillerson, the CEO of Exxon, who says it's an engineering problem. And uh, as an alternative to your work, what doesn't seem to get asked is why are we so convinced that business as usual is the baseline? And you know, there are studies that show that in spite of an incredible growth in GDP in the last 50 years, uh, people aren't any happier. So it seems to me one of the ways to reduce energy use and the uh, consequence of, of carbon uh, in the atmosphere would be, wouldn't it, couldn't we be looking at moving less stuff around and less people? And is anybody in your department looking at that? We, we certainly look at demand reduction. So, you know, making scenarios is an art, not necessarily science, really. So there are lots of lots of rooms to uh, tweak or, or you know develop different trajectories of belief and IPCC have scenarios that look like you know really wide range based on so many different assumptions. So I'm definitely not here to defend my scenario, and I would say our BAU actually assumed pretty aggressive technology improvements over time. Um, and I like the previous comment, we really hope there is fundamental change in people's behaviors and um, all those positive things that will help us reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and environmental impacts. But if we don't make changes, significant fundamental, significantly fundamental changes, we have a problem, like, you know, if we extrapolate from historical lesson, uh, trends and make that uh, and project, continue to project future. But, I do hope that we make some changes. So in the interest of, um, in the interest of time, uh, I'm hoping that, that uh, Sonia, who uh, made heroic efforts to be here today, she took the red eye from, from California. Uh, she had a canceled flight. So she did amazingly well on, on each 